morning. Um, my name is Michael Katz, and uh, I'm speaking to you, uh, obviously, from a remote site in uh, San Antonio, Texas. I uh, regret that I've been unable to uh, join you personally, and I send my regards and thanks to the uh, conference uh, organizers, uh, my good friend and colleague, Dr. Bin Jung, uh, and Dr. Cheng Wang, as well as uh, uh, my uh, friends and colleagues uh, on the podium uh, and, uh, and in the audience. Um, I, uh, this format for this talk uh, being recorded uh, is such that I'll be unable to answer questions and I hope that uh, if you do have any questions, uh, Dr. Jung can provide you with my email and uh, we, can, uh, we can have a, a useful discussion, I hope, at long distance. Dr. Jung asked me to speak on a topic of uh, geriatric importance and uh, I've chosen to speak on uh, this topic uh, shown on this uh, first slide testosterone and aging, the clinical dilemma of the andropause. I use the word clinical dilemma because the issue of testosterone and aging and the definition of the andropause remain unclear, as do issues surrounding the diagnosis of this entity and its treatment. Uh, much of this talk will be focused on whether or not there exists a rationale uh, to treat uh, a decline in testosterone during aging in, uh, in adult men. And uh, uh, therefore, uh, since there are so many questions revolving around this issue, I've used this word, uh, clinical dilemma, this phrase. So first, Let's ask uh, how to try to define the word andropause, and we can provide an operational definition because uh, we are not really sure what this entity is, or frankly, even if it exists. But the operational definition in 2006 is that the andropause is an age-related decline in serum testosterone levels in older men to levels that are below the normal range in young men and associated with a clinical syndrome that is symptoms and signs consistent with androgen deficiency. This term andro andropause has also been called a number of things. Uh, the other names for it include androgen deficiency in the aging uh, male, partial or atom, partial androgen deficiency in the aging male or had them, um, the male menopause, which is inappropriate, as is the term viropause. Only the term andropause has really survived because it seems to relate this age-related syndrome of declining physiologic function to a decline in chemical levels of uh, androgen or testosterone in the circulation. We don't know really what the prevalence or incidence of this syndrome is. There are uh, data that have come out uh, really within the last few months suggesting that the prevalence in the United States may be as much as uh, 2.4 million men between the ages of 40 and 69 with an incidence of as many as 480,000 new cases appearing uh, again in the United States in this same age range. But again, those uh, data are not uh, fixed. And uh, when Dr. Jung and I went to PubMed to try to look to see if any information on this syndrome uh, uh, is available from China and other Asian countries, we really found very little. So much of the information will be from papers appearing in the US literature. So first things first, what are we measuring when we talk about testosterone in the serum and in the circulation? 
testosterone, total testosterone is uh, represented by the total height of this bar. About 30% of total testosterone is bound, strongly bound, and, in a, and uh, unavailable to peripheral tissues by being uh, strongly bound to a, 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 a liver protein called testosterone binding globulin in this slide, but uh, more uh, recently termed sex hormone binding globulin. This, uh, this globulin binds both estrogen and testosterone, as will become clear later in the talk. So this amount is unavailable for biological activity. The bioavailable fraction is that uh, small fraction that is free uh, in the circulation unbound to any proteins, or 2%, and the remainder, about 70%, is weakly bound to albumin. We can measure total testosterone in the serum, we can measure bioavailable testosterone, and we can measure free testosterone. But just because we can measure those doesn't mean we can reliably measure them. And uh, there are assays that are very reliable, and there are assays that are readily commercially available, but not so reliable. This is especially true in measurements of free testosterone, where kits, uh, radiomunoassay kits, are commercially available uh, trying to avoid the cumbersome gold standard uh, techniques of, uh, um, of uh, equilibrium dialysis. Uh, but just because those uh, commercial kits are readily available doesn't make them accurate. In fact, they're notoriously inaccurate. So whenever you measure these tests, uh, whenever you measure these entities, you have to really know uh, the validity of the assays that are being used. Nonetheless, there are reliable data that have been generated over the years in both um, uh, cross-sectional and uh, longitudinal studies of healthy aging men. This is uh, an example of, uh, of uh, data on healthy aging men in the so-called Baltimore Longitudinal Study on Aging from the National Institute on Aging. In the upper panel, we see that total testosterone over the adult lifespan uh, of, the, uh, of, the, uh, of the man decreases gradually, but because of a, a more pronounced increase in SHBG levels uh, with age, shown here as fraction of testosterone bound in the middle panel, there is a more pronounced decline in free testosterone uh, here termed free testosterone index as a function of age. In a much larger uh, group from the Baltimore Longitudinal Study on Aging, we see dots all over the place here uh, as a function of age in, for both total testosterone on the left and free testosterone here again as free testosterone index on the right. And again we see this uh, gradual, uh, uh, somewhat modest decline with age in total testosterone and a more marked uh, decline in free testosterone. You can see the tremendous variability uh, in both measures so that uh, there are uh, men who are uh, very high and rather low at both, uh, in both young and old uh, groups. The lower limits of normal defining chemical hypogonadism in at least young men, somewhere around 11.5 nanomolar or uh, 325 nanograms per deciliter. So if we drew a horizontal line here across uh, this panel for total testosterone, we'd see uh, a number of young and old men uh, who are chemically hypogonadal. This is more pronounced when we look at free testosterone index, where the lower limits of normal for young men is somewhere around 0.13 uh, nanomoles per nanomole by this free testosterone index. So if you drew a line across here, you'd see uh, perhaps more men in the hypogonadal range chemically in both young and older groups. These are all cross-sectional data. There are a number of longitudinal studies that show similar findings. This again from the Baltimore Longitudinal Study on Aging, total testosterone on the left, uh, free testosterone on the right. And looking at individual men as they age over a 10 to 20 year period, 
represented, uh, groups of individual men represented by these uh, uh, lines of finite duration, you can see there's a description of a decline with age that uh, is comparable to that seen in the cross-sectional data of previous slides for both total testosterone on the left and free testosterone on the right. The remarkable thing about these data is that if you uh, try to um, determine the frequency or prevalence of chemical hypogonadism according to the lower limit of normal for a young man or 325 nanograms per deciliter for total testosterone and this uh, 0.13 uh, nanomole per nanomole for free testosterone, you see a, a very marked increase in the frequency of chemical hypogonadism as you increase uh, uh, the age of these normal uh, healthy individuals. For the uh, total testosterone uh, is in the yellow, uh, the yellow bars and free testosterone is in the uh, turquoise or blue bars. You can see that at, in the 50s, somewhere around 10% of individuals are hypogonadal measured by either testosterone or free testosterone. But when you get into older ages, for example in the 70s, although testosterone, the frequency of hypogonadism by measurement of total testosterone increases to about 30%, the increase uh, in free testosterone, in uh, hypogonadism defined by free testosterone uh, is ratcheted up to uh, as much as 70%. So that's, it's, it's probably hard for us to believe that as many as 70% of 70 year olds in at least the United States are chemically hypogonadal. And that's part of the problem of the definition of the syndrome of, uh, of andropause. Um, and uh, we really need uh, uh, even more data to define the cl uh, clinical significance of this high percentage of chemically hypogonadal uh, men, at least by uh, the standards for young hypogonadal men is concerned. What's the mechanism for this decline with androgen level during aging? So it's, it's clear from these studies that uh, testosterone levels do decline uh, during aging. For what reason? Um, I won't spend much time on this, but uh, this is a slide showing several uh, longitudinal cohorts of men uh, from their 60s to their 70s and then following them along uh, for uh, a period of, uh, of 14 years or so, looking at uh, a pituitary uh, gonadotropin secretion, in this case uh, LHRH, which is the pituitary hormone that uh, causes secretion of uh, testosterone from the uh, testicular lytic cell. And as a function of age, the LH levels in all of these cohorts increases uh, uh, during late life. This implies that there is a lack of the classic uh, negative feedback uh, from uh, uh, testicular secretion of testosterone so that the pituitary uh, is then putting out more uh, LH. This implies then that part of the defect that occurs during aging is a primary defect at the level of the testis. Again, I won't uh, belabor this slide, and I refer you to uh, a reference here from 1997. I, I hope you've uh, received uh, uh, handouts that include both of both these slides and uh, and the references are contained uh, in in the handout, and can look at some of these references at your leisure. I will skip over a few of these slides as the talk goes along. Uh, but uh, suffice it to say that uh, looking at all the alterations that are seen in the hypogonadal, in the gonadal axis uh, in males during aging, uh, it appears that not only is there a primary defect at the level of the uh, testis, but there also appears to be a defect in the central nervous system uh, control of hypothalamic secretion of uh, releasing hormones that in turn cause uh, the release of uh, gonadotropins from the pituitary. Pituitary function may in fact be spared during aging, but there seem to be two levels of dysfunction or decrease in function, uh, one at the level of the testis and the other at the interface between the central nervous system and the hypothalamus. Well, so again, we've pretty well pinned down that there is an age-related decline in testosterone levels during aging. 
But the real question is, are there adverse functional consequences to the decline in testosterone that occurs in aging men? If this uh, were the case, this would imply that the decline in testosterone is a treatable entity and would provide a rationale for hormone replacement in men, as we've been wrestling with in women for over several generations. So putting this question in, an, in other terms, is there a rationale to restore low testosterone in an older man to youthful levels? I like to think that uh, we should really uh, revisit the definition of andropause and consider it an hypothesis rather than even an operational definition, given that we don't know yet uh, or we're trying to uh, find if there is a rationale for hormone replacement in older men. And therefore, I'd restate the original, the original definition as the andropause hypothesis. And according to this hypothesis, the decline in testosterone levels with aging is associated with a clinical syndrome that might benefit from hormone replacement. And we'll try to deal with this question and analyze where we are in answering this question during the rest of the talk. Well, what's the derivation of, a, of uh, the rationale to uh, possibly consider uh, hormone replacement in older men? Well, it comes from uh, the associations of uh, the findings, the clinical findings that occur in aging to those that occur that are well recognized uh, in testosterone deficiency that occurs in young men with hypogonadism. Uh, hypogonadism. For example, if you look at a number of uh, clinical uh, parameters on the left, you see that in both aging and testosterone deficiency hypogonadism in young men, muscle mass, muscle strength are decreased. Body fat is increased. Bone mass decreased. Libido decreased, etc., etc. Uh, there's, a, there's a parallelism between aging and uh, hypogonadism in young men. And similarly, if you replace testosterone in young men with hypogonadism, all these arrows shift in direction. So you restore muscle mass and muscle strength in these young men. You reduce body fat, you increase bone mass, etc. So by association, you might assume that in aging, uh, testosterone replacement would result in the same salutary effects. So the goal of testosterone replacement in older men would be to improve muscle mass and strength and stamina to thereby prevent falls, preserve or improve bone mass and prevent fractures, uh, improve libido and sexual function as well as psychological well-being and mood, and possibly decrease cardiovascular disease risk. There is a wealth of evidence, uh, epidemiologic, uh, animal studies, uh, effects of uh, androgens on uh, blood lipid levels and, uh, and fat, uh, fat stores, especially uh, uh, visceral fat, which is a known cardiovascular disease risk, that make us believe that uh, administration of androgens uh, could possibly decrease cardiovascular disease risk. Well, if we are to consider treating old men, older men with the andropause, uh, how do we assess who those men are, at least clinically, in addition to measuring testosterone levels? Well, there are a number of screening questionnaires for androgen deficiency in aging men, or the andropause, and uh, this is one of them uh, that comes from uh, St. Louis uh, in Missouri in the United States. Ten questions that uh, are uh, shown on this slide. Do you have a decrease in libido? Do you have a lack of energy? a decrease in strength or endurance, have you lost height, so forth and so on. You can see that especially if you're uh, an aging male as I am, uh, some of these questions it would be difficult uh, not to answer uh, yes if you're going to be honest about it. Are you falling asleep after dinner and so forth. So uh, it's, uh, these questionnaires uh, have limited value insofar as they have not been fully validated in aging populations. They appear to have uh, adequate uh, uh, sensitivity to uh, uh, the andropause and to androgen deficiency, 
but uh, whether they're specific is another question entirely. And this specific and this particular questionnaire has a specificity of only 60 percent, which is quite inadequate. So if we are having trouble uh, identifying uh, the target population with uh, the clinical entity of the andropause, uh, why is why is that? Uh, there, it turns out that there are uh, a number of variables that influence the diagnosis and treatment of andropause in older men, and I've tried to summarize those with uh, th in three classes. The first being uh, biochemical determinations of testosterone vary. As you can see in this slide uh, from a fairly recent study, again from St. Louis, where 69, an average age of 69-year-old men were followed for a period of eight weeks shown here on the x-axis, and their total testosterone levels were followed. And you can see this looks like a uh, crazy quilt of, uh, of numbers. There's really no uh, uh, steady state, if you will, of uh, testosterone measurements over a period of, uh, of eight weeks. And on the bottom, uh, you can see four individuals uh, that are shown for illustrative purposes. Here in the solid uh, circles is a, a man who remained, I'm sorry, the, uh, the lower limits of normal in this assay is 300 nanograms per ml, so that anybody above is eugonadal and anybody below is hypogonadal chemically. In the solid circles is an individual who remains eugen in the eugonadal range uh, throughout the uh, eight week period. In the open circles is someone who's hypogonadal throughout the entire period. But in the closed triangles here, uh, you see somebody who starts out hypogonadal, ekes out a eugonadal value ha uh, uh, two weeks into the study, goes back into the low range and comes back solidly into the normal range. And then here's uh, somebody in the open triangles who's uh, low throughout the study and then at the end of the study comes back into the normal range. So clearly there's variability in these measurements and one single measurement, a basing uh, diagnosis on a single measurement is uh, is unwise uh, uh, clinically in the clinical uh, environment. I should mention also that there is a uh, very interesting uh, diurnal variation in uh, testicular secretion of testosterone and testosterone concentrations in the circulation. So that in young men, you see over a 24-hour period, you see this dramatic diurnal variation with the lowest values occurring around uh, <coughs> bedtime and the highest uh, values occurring uh, at waking. This diurnal variation is actually lost uh, in older men. And I should also mention that in individual young men, the diurnal variation is such that, so, that at any given time of day, this uh, nadir may fall into the frankly uh, chemically hypogonadal range. The second uh, set of variables influencing the diagnosis uh, and treatment of andropause in any individual older man is that low testosterone values may be secondary to other medical uh, conditions rather than the andropause. This is a, a, a meta-analysis from uh, quite some time ago but has been repeatedly observed in more recent analyses showing that uh, the age-related decline in testosterone levels uh, occurs only in studies in which illness has been factored out. So if you look at mean testosterone level as a function of age, let's just consider two of these lines. It's a little bit complicated, this slide. If in studies in which no illness was excluded, shown in the dotted line here, there's no age-related decline in testosterone. Whereas when all illnesses are excluded, you see this age-related decline that we've seen in earlier slides. There are any number of variables that will decrease uh, testosterone uh, levels in men, young or old. A classic example are uh, opiates. Uh, treatment of pain with opiates in newly hospitalized patients can cause uh, testosterone levels to plummet through the actions of opiates on uh, decreasing uh, uh, hypothalamic uh, secretion of, uh, of gonadotropin releasing hormones to produce a a syndrome called uh, hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. This is transient, and when the opiate uh, treatment is uh, stopped, the testosterone levels recover. Uh, similarly, uh, uh, men with higher BMIs, bone, uh, uh, body mass indexes, have lower testosterones 
than those with lower BMIs. And at any individual age, uh, those who are healthy have been found to, to have higher testosterone levels than those who are not. And finally, uh, the physiological and pathological changes of aging must be, no, uh, must be considered to be multifactorial in, in origin and cannot be attributed to single changes such as a decline in testosterone level. I can't overemphasize uh, this point. For example, uh, you'll recall the association of the uh, andropause and aging uh, with uh, uh, hypogonadism uh, in uh, young men. We could make a very similar slide, as is shown here, uh, comparing the effects of aging to men with pituitary disease producing growth hormone deficiency. Uh, so that in this case we could call normal aging instead of the andropause, it's been called the somatopause to compare uh, the clinical changes to those that occur in growth hormone deficiency from pituitary disease. Again, looking at very similar parameters or measures on the left, you can see that all these arrows go in the same directions in both normal aging and in growth hormone deficiency. And similarly, when you treat growth hormone deficiency with growth hormone, you reverse all these arrows so that we could say, well, let's not treat with testosterone, but rather we'll treat with growth hormone. And in fact, that's the subject of a, of a, a continuing controversy in this area as well, and the subject of another talk that I could uh, speak similarly on to andropause. But this suffices to say that, uh, that uh, the concept of andropause could be broadened to other hormones uh, specifically growth hormone. As an example of the, as two examples of the multifactorial bases for changes in aging, I'd like to call quick attention to two areas. One, uh, the first being a decrease in bone mass. And uh, you know that uh, in men as in women, uh, bone mineral density uh, shown on the uh, y-axis declines gradually as a function of age over the entire lifespan of, uh, of men as it does uh, in women with an exaggerated loss at the time of the menopause. Well, what's the relationship of this decline to testosterone levels? Early studies tried to correlate testosterone levels to the decline in bone mineral density in aging men, but didn't have much luck. Uh, this is just a slide of, of the results of a, of a summary uh, that I, I put together. Uh, for eight early studies, uh, that tried to correlate um, testosterone levels with bone mineral density in aging men. Out of five, of, in five of those eight studies, there was no correlation at all of testosterone uh, with bone mineral density. And only three of those studies were there limited correlations with bone mineral density, and then only in selected sites. So if, if testosterone is not the etiologic agent, if you will, uh, might there be another hormone that uh, could be invoked? Well, the interesting uh, uh, point about this is that, in fact, uh, the other sex steroid hormone has been uh, uh, linked to the decline in bone mineral density in men, as in women, uh, and that hormone is estradiol. Like testosterone, total estradiol in men declines gradually with age, uh, and bioavailable estradiol, shown on this slide, declines uh, to a greater extent in uh, men as uh, in women. And in newer studies uh, that uh, include correlations of both sex hormones with bone mineral density in aging men, they found very surprising results. This just shows uh, <coughs> a representative collection of uh, four population-based studies correlating bone loss in older men and finding uh, a very surprising result, namely, that total estrogen, but not total testosterone concentrations, are associated with bone mineral density in older men. And bioavailable estrogen is a stronger predictor of bone mineral density in older men than is total estrogen. In these newer studies, bioavailable testosterone is positively associated with bone mineral density in older men, but less so than bioavailable estrogen. The bottom line here is that bone loss in older men and I should add fracture risk as well, is correlated more significantly with reduced estrogen levels than with lower androgen levels. Very surprising finding that calls into question just how relevant the decline in testosterone is 
to uh, this particular aspect of the andropause uh, entity, if you will, namely uh, the reduced uh, bone mass. Even if we consider estrogens as partially etiologic, both androgens and estrogens form only uh, essentially one component of a continuum of a, of a large group of genetic, biological, and environmental factors that uh, determine uh, the decline in bone mass uh, with aging and increase the fracture risk. And I won't go all over all of these, but suffice it to say that uh, 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 sex hormones form only one of many influences uh, on bone mass during aging. And the second example I wanted to give of multifactorial uh, uh, causes for changes of aging is reduced sexual activity. In many studies, as in this relatively early study from 1983, uh, a number of uh, measures of sexual activity here, frequency of sexual events, orgasm, morning erections, uh, sexual thoughts, and sexual enjoyment, going uh, from the 40s to the 90s in these successive bars, all show a decline as a function of age. Is this related to testosterone levels? This just shows the conclusion from two early studies that's been uh, uh, reproduced in many studies uh, since then, and that is, that conclusion is that testosterone does play a role, but a small role, uh, in the age-related decline in male sexuality. Other factors, including age per se, appear to be much more important determinants of sexual function. So in all of these uh, slides and studies uh, thus far, I have uh, called the andropause hypothesis into some question, and certainly the rationale for hormone replacement in older men is uh, in some question as well. So why is it uh, that uh, uh, all of us know that uh, there is, uh, um, in our societies, I think uh, uh, around the world, uh, a great interest in hormone replacement in, in men? And I think the reasons for that are not solely scientific. Uh, they also revolve around uh, sociological, uh, cultural, um, and, uh, uh, and even uh, economic uh, uh, aspects of our societies. And I'd like to spend a few minutes uh, discussing the history of testosterone replacement in older men to indicate that our interest today in uh, in this uh, uh, possible therapy is, uh, is not just uh, related to the science, but is also related to exaggerated publicity, or what I call the hype in the hypothesis. Now, the first person to consider uh, administration of testosterone as an anti-aging therapy was Professor Charles Edward Brown Sicard, uh, who lived in the 19th century, a distinguished uh, neurophysiologist and endocrinologist who with uh, Claude Bernard in France um, developed the concept of internal secretions uh, from uh, uh, organs emanating into the general circulation. And Brown Sicard, uh, at a late age of uh, 73, injected himself uh, with uh, extracts of uh, uh, testis and uh, presented that to the scientific community in 1889 uh, wrote that last 1st of June I sent to the Society of Biology a communication which was followed by several others showing the remarkable effects produced on myself by subcutaneous injection of a liquid obtained by the maceration on a mortar of the testicle of a dog or of a guinea pig to which one has added a little water. Well it's been pointed out in the literature that uh, this was homeopathy at its finest because uh, uh, steroid hormones are water insoluble and therefore uh, whatever he was adding had almost no uh, sex steroid in it at all. Nonetheless he reported his results and, uh, and initiated uh, the era of so-called organotherapy uh, which really continues to the present day. The concept of organotherapy, or replacement of a uh, lost uh, uh, essence, um, is really a double-edged sword. Uh, it was a double-edged sword when it was initiated by uh, Brown Sicard. On the one hand, it instilled an interest in 
a legitimate uh, endocrinology and led to the discovery that hypothyroidism could be treated by thyroid extract. It led to the discovery of the active principle in adrenal uh, cortex. It led to the discovery that, uh, that uh, pancreatic extract could be used to treat uh, diabetes. On the other hand, exploitation by non-scientific areas uh, led to uh, a certain disgrace uh, in the uh, inception of the field of endocrinology itself, such that an early luminary uh, of uh, endocrinology uh, uh, in uh, 1933 commented that endocrinology sustained uh, obstetric deformity in its very birth. And that kind of uh, hucksterism uh, and exploitation is shown at this very early time of 1897 in an advertisement in the Bulletin of the Pasteur Institute for extracts of animal organs, uh, brain gray matter, testicular extracts, all available for injection uh, at, a modest, at a modest price. Uh, so this initiated an era of public interest uh, in uh, anti-aging hormone therapy that transcended the scientific community. And it's no accident that uh, an astute uh, social commentator like Oscar Wilde, uh, the uh, British satirist, uh, wrote his, uh, his novel, uh, The Picture of Dorian Gray, at the same time that uh, Ron Sicard was initiating interest in uh, in anti-aging therapy. And this is a photograph of the movie that was made from uh, the uh, uh, picture of Dorian Gray in 1945. This was a story in which a young uh, nobleman uh, made a pact with the devil. He sold his soul in order for the, his portrait to grow old uh, while he remained a pristine youth. And this is a picture from the movie uh, showing both the real Dorian Gray and his portrait. I saw this movie when I was a kid. Uh, and uh, this portrait scared the daylights out of me. It's by a famous portrait artist uh, by the name of Ivan Albright and hangs in the Art Institute of Chicago. And here it is in full color and you can see all the dissolution uh, physically that implies the moral dissolution that occurs at least in this one individual during aging. Most of the interest uh, over the past generations in hormone replacement uh, with aging have clearly been in the aging female to treat postmenopausal women. Uh, this uh, really achieved uh, um, new interest uh, in the early 1960s with the publication of this little book in the United States by a New York City uh, uh, obstetric uh, gynecologist uh, by the name of Robert Wilson. He uh, wrote this book called Feminine Forever, which advocated for hormone replacement in uh, postmenopausal women in order for them to remain indeed forever feminine. And I think uh, this book did more to sell subsequent generations on hormone replacement than almost any other influence. So that uh, over the years we see, uh, not coincidentally, uh, a cartoons uh, that appear in uh, the popular uh, press. Uh, in this case, uh, a recapitulation of the Dorian Gray story, only with a female. Here's the picture of Doreen Gray, where two obviously postmenopausal women are commenting about their uh, uh, their similarly aged uh, uh, friend. That Doreen, she always looks so fabulous. Yeah, it's unbelievable. I mean, we all went to high school together. Look at her, then look at us. Thanks, but no thanks. Doreen, what's your secret? Please tell us. Well, ladies, it's all in this one little bottle. Here's a, uh, a uh, logo, a message from a hypothetical uh, company that uh, supplies uh, this estrogen uh, replacement uh, called Estrico. But then in the 1990s, we begin to see a backlash, and we see the, uh, public, uh, the uh, uh, publication, uh, many publications uh, indicating that uh, the uh, benefits of uh, hormone replacement in women uh, come at a possible cost. In this case, uh, a possible uh, increase in, uh, in stroke and breast cancer, uh, as well as a well-established increase in uh, 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 uterine cancer in the case of unopposed estrogen use. And then finally, in 2002, 
Uh, we see the coup de grace appearing in a number of articles in the Journal of the American Medical Association, a very large population-based study called the Women's Health Initiative uh, that is sponsored uh, that was sponsored by the National Institute uh, Institutes of Health on the risks and benefits of estrogen plus of progestin in healthy postmenopausal women, indicating that in this particular population uh, there was clear risk in terms of increases in breast cancer, uh, cardiovascular risk, uh, and, and risk of uh, stroke. So we've sort of come full circle in the case of hormone replacement for women. What about the case in men? Well, in the words of the famous uh, baseball uh, player, uh, New York Yankees baseball player uh, Yogi Berra, who's also a, a cockeyed uh, philosopher in his own right, in terms of when we think of testosterone replacement in older men, it's deja vu all over again, said Yogi Berra. And why is that? Well, the interest in hormone replacement in men uh, has, uh, has been generated in large part by the availability of new forms of testosterone replacement that are much easier to tolerate than uh, earlier forms. For many years, the only form we had available were depot testosterone uh, 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 formulations in oil that had, be, had to be injected deeply and painfully into the uh, muscle. But in the 90s, uh, transdermal uh, testosterone began to be available. And uh, here we see in 1996, uh, in a cover story for the uh, national uh, U.S. magazine Newsweek, the uh, advent of testosterone transdermal patches. And uh, here it's called Super Hormone Therapy, Can It Keep Men Young? Uh, the New Transdermal Testosterone Patch. In that same issue, we see uh, 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 figures like this, in which we see a young man and all the positive attributes of youth with an old man looking wistfully over his shoulder at all the uh, problems that he's developed that his, young, uh, uh, that his uh, younger uh, colleague here doesn't have. I'm sort of particularly interested in this, uh, in this particular uh, uh, pie chart uh, down here that uh, uh, measures the erection degrees above the horizontal so that at age 30, uh, erections are 20 degrees above the horizontal. By the time you get to age 70, it's minus 25 degrees. This is a popular magazine, I remember, and uh, the original uh, citation is not given. I've yet to find uh, the original data and uh, the study design, how this was even measured, but I think it's rather amusing. The problem with the patch was that uh, uh, it wasn't perfect, and uh, in cases where men uh, exercised heavily, the patches uh, uh, sweated off uh, and, or else uh, caused irritation um, and rashes and was discontinued in a large proportion of uh, men. However, in the year 2000 or so, a new formulation of transdermal uh, testosterone became available and we saw uh, an even greater ratcheting up of a promotion for uh, testosterone replacement. So that we see ads on the internet, let's say fatigue, depressed mode, low sex drive, could be your testosterone is running on empty. Try androgel and testosterone is restored. In this case, it's just a gel that you apply to the skin so that the previous uh, problems with the uh, patch are eliminated. And again, uh, we see cover stories from uh, national magazines uh, like Time Magazine in the year, I think this is 2000, talk again about testosterone that restores sex drive, boosts muscle mass, and soon you can get it in a gel. But here, creeping into the equation is the same question that arose in hormone replacement for women. It also can be dangerous. Is the edge worth it? Despite uh, this uh, precaution, which I'll uh, elaborate on in a moment, the number of prescriptions uh, that, uh, have been, that were written from the year 1999 to the year 2002 uh, increased uh, very dramatically, largely because of the advent of testosterone in a gel fashion. And in fact, uh, if you take this graph back to the year 1993, 
there was something like a 500 percent increase in the number of prescriptions for testosterone. And most of these, of course, were not for young men with hypogonadism, which is an insignificant uh, a fraction of the population, but were in middle-aged men who wanted that extra edge uh, to their strength and uh, vigor and vitality. Not even uh, used so much for older men, but in middle-aged men. With respect to the precautions uh, raised, uh, here come the scientific community reacting to the advent of transdermal testosterone in a number of editorials uh, with titles like Testosterone, Fountain of Youth or Drug of Abuse? Testosterone Supplementation in Older Men, a rational idea whose time has not yet come. Many questions, few answers for testosterone replacement. Androgen deficiency in the aging male, fact, fiction, or too early to say. And in all of these, ed uh, oh, I'm sorry, uh, and then comes uh, actually a, uh, a physician writer uh, who writes uh, for the New Yorker magazine, um, Jerome Groupman, comes up with an article in 2002 that asks, is the male menopause or andropause a question of medicine or a matter of marketing? And in this article, he questions the wisdom of using uh, chemical determinations of testosterone to gauge the need for hormone replacement and asked at the bottom of this cartoon, should a 70-year-old have the testosterone levels he had at 20? The bottom line, is the precaution in all of these uh, uh, editorials and articles written by the medical community is that uh, in the jargon of, uh, of English, the 800-pound gorilla or the primary uh, a manifestation of a side effect that we worry about is the fear that testosterone will promote the development of prostate cancer. A question that only clinical trials of testosterone replacement in older men can answer. Well, so we've seen the andropause hypothesis. I've tried to give you an idea of what the hype is in the hypothesis. But what are the data from clinical trials? And it turns out that there are relatively few randomized controlled trials of testosterone administration in older men. Somewhere in the uh, mid-30s uh, is the total number of uh, randomized controlled trials uh, of, of this possible therapy. And usually, uh, testosterone is administered to small numbers of healthy older men. Uh, the criteria for entry to these studies vary considerably so that Many of the men who are healthy have normal to moderately low baseline testosterone. They do not have low testosterone levels for the most part. The protocols differ and the endpoints differ and there are of questionable relevance to function, which is what we are trying to maximize in the older individual. Most of, importantly, these studies are of short duration so that they may be able to detect uh, salutary uh, positive uh, benefits, but uh, but at the uh, expense of not being able to detect long-term risk, especially uh, that of uh, development of prostate cancer that might be dependent on androgen growth, uh, on androgen, uh, that, that prostate growth might be de uh, dependent on androgen. One of the first studies that I like to cite, uh, because it's uh, in, in one of the first uh, responsible studies in, uh, in uh, what I've called the modern era of organotherapy, uh, came out in 1992 by Lisa Tenover. Again, a small study of 13 healthy men, ages 57 to 76, total and free testosterone levels were below the normal range of about 300 to 350 nanograms per deciliter in young men. Each subject was their own control. They received three months of intramuscular testosterone and three months of placebo, but in random order. Clinical and biochemical parameters were measured at baseline and at three and at six months. The results shown in this slide were that testosterone, in fact, increased serum testosterone, not surprising, increased lean body mass, decreased uh, measures of uh, bone resorption, a measure of bone resorption, increased uh, uh, red blood cell count or hematocrit, uh, decreased total and LDL cholesterol, and importantly, did increase uh, serum uh, prostate-specific antigen, a possible <coughs> predecessor for prostate uh, growth. On the other hand, measures of prostate growth did not change. 
should be pointed out, however, that in those men who went from testosterone treatment to the placebo, their PSA levels, which increased only in the normal range, did not become abnormal. But they did not go back down once the testosterone was, uh, was removed. In the placebo group, there was no change in any of these parameters. So this was a provocative study and promoted the scientific community's interest in uh, carrying out more and larger clinical studies. Probably the most uh, important study, in my view anyway, largely because it was the largest study and the study that uh, continued for the longest period of time came out of the University of Pennsylvania by Peter Snyder and his colleagues. And what he did was to take a, a 108 uh, men who were average age over 65 years and who had levels of testosterone that were lower than the mean uh, in younger men and had bone mineral density uh, that was lower than that of uh, younger men. Followed them with uh, uh, testosterone patches uh, over a period of 36 months, the longest study that's ever been done, to determine uh, as a primary outcome whether bone mineral density increased uh, as a function of testosterone treatment. And the overall conclusion was that testosterone administered for three years to these men over 65 years of age increased lumbar spine bone mineral density, but only in those subjects with relatively low pretreatment values of serum testosterone. And that result is shown on this slide. <clears throat> on the left-hand side, we see the testosterone and placebo groups, uh, bone mineral density as a function of the 36 month of treatment. And we see actually that bone mineral density increases in both the placebo and testosterone groups, probably largely on the basis of encouragement of these uh, subjects to take vitamin D and calcium during the uh, period of the study. But there is a difference uh, between testosterone and placebo that shows up variably over the, uh, uh, over the uh, period of the study. The interesting part of the, uh, of the result is shown on the right hand side and that shows testosterone's effect on percent change in uh, lumbar spine bone mineral density as a function of pretreatment testosterone concentration low levels of concentration at entry to the study on the left, high concentrations on the right. So that only those men who had low levels of testosterone to begin with responded with an increase, uh, responded to testosterone administration with an increase in uh, bone mineral density. This is a theme that recurs throughout this study and several other studies. Some other results of note in this uh, particular study, looking at fat mass on the left, and lean body mass or skeletal muscle uh, mass on the uh, right. Uh, compared with placebo in the open circles, the closed circles showed that testosterone decreased fat mass and increased uh, lean body mass, a finding that is seen in uh, a number of studies as well. In the interest of time, I think I'm going to skip through some of these uh, slides because they reiterate some of the same points. Uh, and just focus on the major points of uh, this uh, study from the University of Pennsylvania and others. The result from this study with regard to serum PSA was such that there was a significant increase of PSA in the normal range in the testosterone treated group which did not decline but did not go further, uh, did not increase further during the remainder of the study. But this was uh, elevated above placebo levels despite the fact that there were no urinary symptoms or evidence of prostate enlargement. And I'm going to skip, frankly, all of these. Uh, in your handout, there are very few studies that ask uh, not the question that's been asked in most of these studies, and that is, does testosterone have a therapeutic role in so small groups of healthy men, but looks at probably the right target population of frail older men but I'm afraid uh, the data there are conflicting and we have a lot more studies to await you know, to answer this question as well. The summary of uh, controlled studies uh, uh, appeared in an article in the Journal of Gerontology in 2002 looking at the potential benefits and possible risks. And uh, here are all these outcome measures that we become familiar with. And in general, uh, there's an increase in lean body mass, a decrease in fat mass. In general, we see no real functional uh, readouts of testosterone uh, therapy, and that's been a deficiency in the literature. 
there appears to be a, an increase in bone mineral density, but from the Snyder study, only if testosterone levels are low initially, and the fracture risk, uh, the effect on the fracture risk is unknown. All of these other uh, uh, parameters uh, have an, a really an unknown response to testosterone therapy. In terms of the potential risk, uh, many studies show an increase in hematocrit to uh, abnormally high levels, and, and a number of subjects have had to discontinue uh, testosterone due to erythrocytosis. The real question, as I had mentioned earlier, is whether this might result in clinical prostate disease. Uh, we do know that PSA from several studies increases in the normal range, but we have no idea whether uh, the, uh, the use of testosterone in this population results in clinical prostate cancer. So in conclusion uh, from all of these clinical studies, we, we have a very vague set of conclusions from at least one review in 2003, and that's that testosterone cannot be recommended in older healthy men with normal or low normal testosterone levels and no clinical manifestations of hypogonadism, and that's a given. Testosterone replacement may, and that's the operational word, may be warranted in older men with markedly decreased testosterone levels regardless of symptoms, or possibly in men with mildly decreased testosterone and symptoms or signs suggesting hypogonadism. But the important point to note, and the one certainty here, is that the long-term safety and efficacy of testosterone supplementation remain uncertain. And because of this uncertainty, the question was uh, referred to the Institute of Medicine, which is a branch of the uh, National Academy of Sciences, to try to assess the need for clinical trials of testosterone replacement therapy. This was done in 2003, and the committee continued to meet for about a year before it came out with its report in 2004. And this committee uh, was charged to prepare an evidence-based report, including recommendations on the design and conduct of a large-scale clinical trial on testosterone replacement therapy in older men if such a study is deemed to be advisable. The conclusion of uh, this committee was that uh, clinical trials should continue in older men. It should uh, begin with more short-term efficacy trials to determine possible benefit and then conduct long-term studies of potential risk only if short-term efficacy is established. Safety is paramount uh, and continue basic further research in this area as well. I want to close with uh, a reminder that, there are, as I've mentioned several times, there are a number of testosterone uh, modalities or preparations available. But I would ask, is there an alternative way of thinking uh, to treat some of the aspects of what we would call andropause by therapies that are more specific and less generalizable than hormone uh, uh, replacement therapy? And. Uh, I would just, uh, here is a very interesting study which I'll just call your attention to in your handout, but indicate that, for example, in the case of bone loss in aging men, there are any number of uh, approaches to the specific therapy of bone loss in aging men uh, that have resulted from the basic sciences uh, that uh, involve any number of possible agents that uh, would have less uh, adverse effects than uh, generalized hormone uh, therapy, uh, replacement therapy. And this same kind of, uh, uh, of uh, a question uh, or retreat to the basic sciences has been brought up with respect to the Women's Health Initiative such that uh, it's been pointed out that there were uh, 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 reasons to believe that the population study in the WHI was not generalizable and there was a call for future, that future clinical trials fully integrating the complex pleiotropic action of estrogens and progesterone in their analogs will provide answers to questions on postmenopausal roles for hormone therapy. I'll leave you with three quotes, two from uh, William Crowley, a reproductive endocrinologist. When you elevate the testosterone levels in a 70-year-old man to those he had at 20, are you really returning him to normal? He went on to say, it's overly simplistic to attribute such a complex process as aging to the change in the level of a single hormone like estrogen or testosterone. And finally, a quotation from uh, a Baltimore uh, journalist from the uh, early 1900s, uh, the early 20th century, 
there's always an easy solution to every human problem, neat, plausible, and wrong. Uh, this is where uh, Dr. Zhang and I do our work in San Antonio, the VA hospital, and with that I'll close and, uh, and apologize again for not uh, being with you personally and hope you were able to get something out of this talk. Uh, and please uh, email me for questions. Thank you very much.